Hello everyone, in this video we are going to be solving May June 2009 of uh, Physics Paper 1 Multiple Choice AS. This is uh, Paper 1 or AS level. We are going to try to solve this entire paper. Let's see. So with statement involving multiples and sub-multiples of base units is correct. Okay, so let's see first option. Uh, 1 picometer is equal to 10 to the power minus 9. This is incorrect. We can say 1 picometer is actually equal to 10 to the power minus 12 meter. Uh, option B, 1 nanometer is equal to 10 to the power minus 6 meter. This is also incorrect because 1 nanometer is equal to 10 to the power minus 9 meters. Uh, 1 millimeter is equal to 10 to the power 6 micrometer. Uh, this is actually incorrect because 1 millimeter is actually equal to 10 to the power uh, 3 micrometer. So this is incorrect. One kilometer is equal to 10 to the power 6 meter. This is a correct uh, thesis. One kilometer is equal to uh, 1 million millimeter. So that's correct. So for number one, the answer is going to be D. Moving on to the next question, the diagram shows uh, the resultant force and its horizontal and vertical components. Uh, the horizontal component is 20 newton and theta is equal to 30 degrees. So theta is equal to 30 degree and horizontal component is 20 newtons. What is the vertical component? So we know that horizontal component, so let's call it fx, is equal to f cos theta. So from here we can find out the original force, which is fx by cos theta. So we know that fx is 20 divided by cos theta, so cos theta is 30. So if we use our calculators, 20 divided by cos 30 will be giving me around 40 by root 3 by 3 newtons. This will be the result. So for vertical component, let's call it Fy. It's going to be 40 root 3 by 3 times sine 30. Since vertical component is the sine, uh, sine component and the horizontal component is the cos component. So this will be times sine 30. You're going to use your calculator. This comes out to around 11.547 newtons, which is close to 11.5. So our correct answer is going to be C. Moving on to the uh, next uh, question. I hope it's a little bit clear on the screen. I can see it, but I hope you can also. The diagram shows uh, the stem of a Celsius thermometer marked to show initial and final temperature values. Initial temperature, final temperature. Okay. So the initial temperature, if you are not able to see, it's uh, from 10. Uh, it's going to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this is 7 divisions. So, okay, this is 7 divisions if you are not unable to see it. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so let's come from here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this right here is eight divisions. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, seven divisions. Seven divisions and eight divisions. Well, what is the temperature change exposed to an appropriate number of significant figures? Okay, so. I can say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So I can say that for, for 10 divisions, what is the temperature change? Minus 5, minus, minus 10. So this should be uh, minus 5, minus, minus 10 should be a positive 5 increase in temperature change. So 5, uh, sorry, not 5 div. Uh, this is going to be positive 5. Okay, positive 5 degree Celsius change. I don't know if it's in degree, okay, this is in degree Celsius. So what about one division? It's going to be 5 over 10. This is positive 5 over 10. That's plus, uh, it sh I think it's 0.2 if I'm not wrong. Oh no, this is 0.5, sorry. Plus 0.5 degree Celsius change. So what can we say? That we have 7 divisions over here. So 7 times 0.5, okay? So what I want to do is I want to do minus 10 plus 7 times 0.5 to get my initial reading. So minus 10 plus uh, 7 times 0.5. That will give me initial of 6.5 degree. Over here, what is the final? We want to add from positive 10 to 8 times uh, 0.5, okay? So 8 
times 0.5. That should be 14 degree Celsius. So my temperature change uh, should be around 14. This should be around 20.5 degree Celsius. Now, uh, the significant figure is going to be like this. Since every division is 0.5 degrees Celsius, right? We figured out 0.5. So our answer should also be in one decimal place. Uh, and we have 10 and 5. And so it should be within three significant figures because we have two SF over here and one decimal place over here. In total, we are going to, having, we are going to be having three significant figures. So our answer is going to be B. So exactly B, we don't need to round it up. Okay, the diagram shows a digital voltmeter and analog ammeter readings from a circuit in which electrical heating is occurring. Okay, so uh, we have our volts and we have our amps. Uh, what is the electrical power? So we know that power is equal to V times I, voltage multiplied by current. Now we have to figure the ammeter reading, right? We have to figure the ammeter reading before we can do it. So we know the voltmeter reading, which is digital, but for the ammeter, uh, we can say that uh, the center reading is 0.5. Is it very helpful? This is 0.1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we can say 5 divisions is equal to 0.1 amperes. Then what is 1 division? 1 division is 0.1 by 5 amperes. So after 4, we have 1, 2, 3, 4. So this is, after 4, we have 4 divisions. So we have to add 4 plus 1.5 by uh, 5. Oh, sorry, 0 0.1 by 5, sorry. So we have 0 0.1 by 5, uh, that is uh, around approximately 4.2 amperes. So if we do our calculation, so for, to, for millivolts, if we convert to volts, 1, 2, 3. So it's going to be 1.2 volts, okay? If you cannot see it in your screen, this is 1,200 millivolts. So 1.2 times 0 0.42. So 1.2, uh, this is around... If I'm not wrong. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, millibolts and then we have it amps. So For some reason, my answer is coming out to 0 0.504 watts. So let's go ahead and read the question again. Electrical power on the heater. So 1200, and we have this uh, meter attached to this. Let's do it this way. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So let's change it a bit. 10 divisions, it should be the same in my opinion. So therefore, one division is 0.2 by 10 amperes. Okay, so uh, how many divisions do we have over here? We have got 10, we've got 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So in total, this is 24 division. So 24, uh, forget this for now. Uh, so 24 into 0 0.2 by 10. So let's see, 24 into 0 0.2 by 10. This will give me, oh, this actually gives me 4.8 amperes. Not 4.2. I'm very sorry. So, uh, why did I cancel this out? Well, I cannot count from here because this division, I'm taking it from the starting point. So, I should also calculate from the starting point. I shouldn't calculate from the center. So, this should give me uh, 0 0.48. So, let's see if the answer kind of matches right now. Yes. So, we get 0 0.576 uh, watt, which is approximately 0 0.58 watt. So, our answer is going to be B. Okay. Oh. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next uh, question. So the next question, which displacement time, okay, and we use this, which displacement time graph best represents the motion of a falling sphere? The initial acceleration of which eventually reduces until it begins to travel at constant terminal velocity. 
So what happens? So the displacement, okay, so this is going to be, so displacement obviously increases. So it's a stone at uh, starting from a starting point O, okay? This is our origin point. And we're dropping it to the ground and eventually it kind of reaches terminal velocity. Here it has an acceleration, but it's decreasing, right? So we can immediately go ahead and see displacement decreasing in option A and B. So we can cancel these two out because this is not possible according to logic of physics. Now, displacement cannot go constant because it's increasing from its starting when it's falling down. It will not become constant. This is a velocity time graph. Okay, this would be an accurate velocity time graph, but it's not an accurate displacement time graph. So, the answer should be for this question is D, that the displacement is first increasing non-uniformly because there is an increase in velocity. Then velocity becomes constant, so there's a uniform increase in disp the displacement. Okay, hope this is clear. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, question six, uh, a car drive, uh, a car driver sees a hazard ahead. She applies the brakes as soon as she can bring the car to, uh, as soon as she can, car, uh, as, as soon as she can and brings the cars to rest. Okay, so she sees something and she brings the car to rest. Okay, so this is the graph. Uh, hopefully you can see the graph clearly. I can see it, but uh, this is very dark. So hopefully you can see it in your screen as well. The graph shows how the speed v of the car varies with time t after she sees the hazard. Okay, so she sees the uh, hazard at t1. Which graph uh, represents uh, the variation with time t of the distance s traveled by the car after she has seen the hazard? Okay, so let's take a look at the options. So from here, we can immediately cancel option A. Like this will increase and it goes constant. This is not possible. So it's either between B, C, and D. Okay. So as you can see, velocity is increasing. So velocity is decreasing. So there's change in velocity uniformly. So we know that the displacement time graph cannot be a linear displacement time graph, right? Because there is a change in velocity. There's rate of change in velocity. So the gradient is not constant for the displacement time graph because the displacement time graph gradient will give us the velocity. So B is wrong. So it can be between C and D. Okay. So now let's take a look at uh, this over here. So initial displacement is uh, over here, it's constant. So as we can see that from this graph, initially it is constant. So this, this is constant. So there will be a linear displacement graph initially. So we can see both of them have a very slight linear graph. At T1, it becomes curved once again, right? At T1, it becomes, so over here at T1 again, it starts to become curved and it goes to become curved. But over here, you can see that it has a steeper increase instead of a decrease. This is increasing. This is a steep gradient increase, not a decrease. This one is curving down, but this is curving upwards. So this person won't increase because the car is coming to a rest. So ultimately, it'll just like kind of stop over here. So this is incurring because the rate is increasing. So my answer for this question is going to be C. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Which statement about Newton's laws of motion is correct? The first law follows from the second law. Okay, so what is the first law? If there is no rate of uh, change of any forces, right? If there is no resultant force, sorry, not rate of change of forces, from if there is no resultant force, uh, the object will continue in a straight line. And the second law is basically rate of change of momentum, d by dt of mv, or in our A levels, this is a much more simpler formula, mass times acceleration, because mass is constant, and dt by dt is basically acceleration. If you have learned from mechanics, the rate of change of uh, velocity. So yes, F, this is F net. This is the resultant force, right? You calculate using this formula, we always calculate the resultant force. Let's say you had an object and it had a forward force and it had a friction. So what would you do? You would uh, minus forward force, uh, minus friction, and then you would write M A, right? You usually write this. So we can say that the first law has been derived. Uh, sorry, the second law is not derived, but it actually comes from the first law that there won't be any resultant force if there's no rate of change of velocity, right? So we can say J option A is correct. B is third law follows from the second law. Third law is the reaction force. Reaction force has nothing to do with this formula. This is wrong. Reaction force actually has to do with the formula F is equal to mu R, uh, where mu is the coefficient of friction of a surface and R is the reaction force. This is one of the formula, but this is not the formula that actually deals with reaction force. 
conservation of energy is a consequence of the third law. No, it's not a conservation of energy. It's just that there is a opposing force to any object if a force is applied. Conservation of linear momentum is a conse uh, consequence of the first law. No, this is a consequence of the second law, not the first law. Momentum is it? Uh, d by dt of mb. So this is also incorrect. So this has to be a. Okay, the next question says the diagram shows the path of a golf ball. Okay, which row describes the changes in the horizontal and in the uh, vertical components of the golf ball's velocity when air resistance forces are ignored? So uh, it goes into projectile. So when air resistance is ignored, we always know that horizontal com component remains the same as ux cos theta, where ux is the initial horizontal component. So it is constant. However, the vertical component is affected by gravity. So the vertical component is uy sine theta, where uy is the initial vertical component, minus, uh, if you consider the gravitational constant, g, t. So I'm just writing g because in physics we use 9.81 and in mechanics we use 10, so I'm just writing the constant g. So over here, constant acceleration downwards. Yes, there is a constant acceleration downwards, decrease in upwards and increase in downwards. No, the acceleration is always g, right? g, which is equal to 9.81 meter per second squared. Sorry, this is squared. So this is incorrect. So it's going to be uh, C. My 8 is going to be C. Okay, let's uh, move on to the next uh, question. A tennis ball of mass 100 gram is struck uh, by a tennis racket and the velocity of the ball change, uh, changes. What is the magnitude of the change of momentum of the ball? So what is the magnitude change in momentum? So basically impulse is initial minus final momentum, right? Initial minus final momentum. So I'll do, I'm going to consider that this direction of mine is going to be positive. Okay. So I can basically say 100 divided by 1000 because we have to convert it into, so what is momentum? Momentum is mass times velocity. This is defined as momentum. So, uh, 100 divided by 1000 into 20 minus. And then this will uh, eventually change, right? Now, you were thinking that uh, impulse, okay, so the formula for impulse in most books, and to be actually fair, is actually the final momentum minus the initial momentum. Now, you might be saying that, okay, if I use this method, then it doesn't match with impulse. Well, impulse also is a direction. So, when the ball hits here, the racket pushes it back that way. So the direction of impulse is this way. So again, the signs will reverse. So you can use the impulse method or this is the method I like. Minus, initial minus, and now the final direction is uh, negative. So it's going to be negative 30 divided by 1 by 1000. So if I take my calculator, it's going to be 500 by 1000 times 30. So this is basically going to be 5 kg meter per second or basically 5 newton second. So the answer for number 9 is going to be V. Okay. Now, unfortunately, thanks to my uh, PDF uh, software, I'm using dark mode. So the fraction is like gone. So just to make sure that these are actually fractional values. Okay. These are fractions. Okay, uh, so a stationary body explodes into two components of masses m and 2m. What is the uh, value of the ratio of x by y? Okay, so x by y. So what is x kinetic energy? Kinetic energy. So basically what is the kinetic energy of x? So I'm going to call it ekx half m. Okay. Uh, so now what do you uh, do about the velocity of the two objects? So we can eventually, we can easily find the uh, velocity. Can we? Kinetic energy is x and kinetic energy y uh, respectively. Okay. What can we do? A stationary body explodes into two components of masses m and 2m. Direction 
this one moves so acha so i don't need to call it ekx i can simply use x is half m v squared okay so now what is the velocity so let's assume okay let's assume the velocity of m is v meter per second so what is uh using momentum conservation i'm going to consider this direction to be positive so this is going to be minus mv plus 2m let's call it a bigger v so uh, what what do you think is going to be b okay so it's going to be basically mv is 2mv so mm cancels out sorry i cancelled out uh sorry uh i cancelled out a, a v so basically v is 2 big v so the big v is basically v over 2 v meter per second so this is moving at v over 2 meter per second so this is my initial x what about my y okay the kinetic energy of this so half times 2m times half v whole square so this is basically going to be uh 1 by 4 mv squared right So basically, x is half m v squared, and this is one by four m v squared. So m v squared and m v squared cancels out. So if we want to do it's point five divided by zero point two five, which should be giving a ratio of two by one. So for my ten, the answer is going to be c, which is two by one. Okay. So once again, thanks to my PDF software, the uh, the PDF has gone berserk. So let's try to understand. The diagram represents the speed under water P, Q, R, and S, uh, and forces are acting on the sphere due to the pressure of the water. Each force acts perpendicular to the sphere's surface. P and R are in opposite directions. So P and R are in opposite directions. So now, if you consider, I'm going to draw the diagram. Okay, if you consider the pressure profile of this uh, object, so this is going to be P. It's going to be R. Consider the pressure profile of the object. R is going to be greater than P, so R is going to be greater than P. I can put this conclusion because more there's let's say this there's more liquid, and it's more liquid is pushing the you know sphere up. So R is obviously greater than P, but this is in the same level. So the pressure profile is going to be same. So I can say S is equal to Q. Okay. Uh, okay. I want to give you the uh, I want to give you guys the PDF of this. I'm going to bring it inside the PDF after you know exporting. S is equal to Q. So as you can see, S is equal to S is equal to S. So all of them can be correct, but R has to be greater than P. So P is less than R is a correct statement. So P is less than R is a correct statement. So that means the answer is going to be A. We don't have we didn't have to work out a lot of things. Okay, let's move on to the uh, next question. An object made from two equal masses joined by a light rod falls a uh, falls with uniform speed through the air. So there is an object like this. It's Falling with uniform speed, but there. So both of them will have the same speed. The rod remains horizontal. Which depends on the equilibrium of the system is correct. It is not in equilibrium because it is falling steadily. Um, no, that is not correct because uh, what if uh, there is a forward force? Sorry, a upward force. And oh no, this is actually an equilibrium. Sorry, this is actually an equilibrium, but it's a, this is not an equilibrium. Is it falling steadily? This force, this is which is friction, and let's say this is weight, they cancel each other out. But it is not an equilibrium. This is wrong. This is not an equilibrium. This is wrong. It is an equilibrium. So it is not an equilibrium. So it's totally wrong. So it is an equilibrium. Yes, because there's no resultant force and no resultant torque. It's correct. There is a resultant torque. There is no resultant torque over here, or else there would be forces acting from the side as well. So there is no torque. So the answer has to be. For twelve, it has to be D. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay, so this is uh, an interesting question. It's pretty tricky. Uh, so for number thirteen, a spindle is attached uh, at one end to the center of a lever, one point two meter long, and at its other end to the center of a disc of radius two zero point two meter. Okay. Uh, a Cord is wrapped around the disc and passes over a pulley, and attached to okay the 900 newton force. So first let's find out the tension in the wire. So the block is 900 newton, so the tension has to be also 900 newton since it's not accelerating. So the force that this is pulling is 900 newton. This is 900 newton. What is the minimum force if applied to the lever that could lift the weight? 
interesting. So as you can see that we have to consider the fact that the torque is uh, being applied over here and the perpendicular distance, okay? So we have to use the principles of moment here. So the perpendicular distance uh, from, so as you can see, the torque will give a, uh, the forces F will give a torque in the clockwise direction. Whereas this tension is trying to go at an opposite. So it's going to try to move it in an anti-clockwise direction. And when you consider the principle of moments, uh, if this is your pivot, okay, so the center point, this is the center point is your pivot. You can see the central point that is connecting everything. So what we can say is that from the torque, the, what is the distance? What is the distance from the torque? Because what is torque? Sorry, not torque actually, the couple force is basically FD, where D is like the perpendicular distance. So the perpendicular distance is half of 1.2. All right, so if we do half of 1.2, what do we get? We get 0.6 meters. Half of 1.2, uh, we get 0.6 meters. So 0.6 times F should give me the torque, which is 900 times, okay. So the disc, uh, so as you can see the wire, is rotating about a radius of 0.2. So how did I know? So if you consider the disc like this, the wire is coiling around the disc, right? So the wire is coiling around pushing the force. So how much is the distance from the disc, uh, from the wire? 0 0.2 meter. Now if you think of it practically, it is true that yes, there will be some more distances over your hand then, but uh, we'll assume that this is 0 0.2 because obviously we're at AS level and we don't need to think that deep about uh, this because then you can actually go ahead and uh, talk about uh, many factors over here, right? Uh, okay. Might have an insert. Okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, one thing that I made a mistake, uh, which is, let's say this is the center point of a circle. And we have uh, torque over here. This is how the torque is being applied of any object, right? So this is, let's say, F. The distance is not from not from the pivot, but the distance between the two forces. So we won't consider 0 0.6. This is not uh, uh, yeah, this is not going to be working for the principle of a uh, couple force, right? A couple force always like you know acts in the opposite direction, and we calculate the distance between the couple forces. So we have to take the full distance. Okay, so let me just write here: uh, couple forces. So why did we take 1.2? The special reason is they are a couple force. That's why you're taking 1.2. And 900 into 0 0.2. So F is 900 times 0 0.2 divided by 1.2. Now Cambridge is really smart. What they did is they, uh, if I had taken the 0 0.6, I would have actually gotten a wrong answer that was actually an option, point, uh, 300 newtons. They wanted to test you that if you knew the um, principles of a couple force. So if you do the math correctly, this is 150 newtons. So the answer is going to be B for number 13. Okay, so once again, the fractions are actually gone. These are fractional values. Okay, the forward motion of a motor board, uh, boat is opposed by forces F, which vary with the boat speed V in accordance with the relation F is equal to KV squared, where K is the constant. Effective power of the propellers required to maintain uh, the speed V is P, which expression relates K, P, and V. Okay. So power is equal to force times velocity. So power is, according to the relation, F is equal to where K is a constant. Uh, open the force level, which can vary with the both speed V in the accordance. So power is basically F times V. We know that power P is P. F over here is going to be K V squared times V. So power is basically K V Q. So K should be P by uh, V Q, which is C. They might be saying that, okay, why did I consider this a constant? Well, the K constant is constant, and so let's say for a particular velocity, okay, let's say when the velocity is 15, 
uh, the force is going to remain constant because k is constant always regardless of the value of velocity. So if we change velocity, only then f changes. So for a particular point, for a particular velocity, we're considering the velocity to be v. So it's like constant. For a particular point of velocity, like when the velocity is 10, when the velocity is 20. So for a particular velocity at the whole journey or in during the whole journey. So that's just going to be c. Uh, the diagram shows two identical vessels x and y, uh, short pipe with a tap. Okay. Initially, X is filled with water of mass M up to the depth H and Y is empty. When the tap is open, water flows from X to Y until the depths of water are both equal. All right, so when is it going to be equal? In the midpoint, obviously, because it's fully filled and you'll fill it. So both of these have to be equal. So let me use a different color since it's white. So let's say this one. So what is the midpoint? The midpoint's height is basically half H. Some potential energy is lost by the water during this process. So this much water, okay, this much water having mass M, because mass is always constant of the uh, water, right? This much mass M is falling a height of half uh, H. So GPE lost is actually Mg half H. So it's actually half Mg H or Mg H by two. Second fractions are lost. So number 15, the answer should have been okay no 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 sorry the mass will remain constant throughout the whole liquid but when half of the water is going you're only considering half of the mass right half of the mass of water so half of the mass of water and half of the height of water so we have another half so into another half which is one by four mgh so we are going to having uh we're going to have option b as an answer one by four mgh will be my uh, answer Uh, question number 16, which will best describes how the molecules move in solids, liquids, and gases? Okay, so I'm doing this video for this syllabus for upcoming 2022 and 2023 episode, 2023 and above, right? 2023 and above. So ideal gases and uh, thermodynamic physics, solids and liquids are moved to A2 syllabus. They're no longer in AS syllabus. So I'm not going to do these questions. Okay, next, uh, the diagram shows a flask connected to a U-tube containing uh, liquid. The flask contains air at atmospheric pressure, okay? So this is atmospheric pressure. The flask is now gently heated and the liquid in the level in the right-hand side of the tube uh, rises through distance H. So this uh, liquid rises through distance H. So let's say it has risen a distance H. The density of the liquid is rho. What is the increase in pressure uh, of the liquid when it is uh, heated okay so if the liquid rises a height of h over here the liquid will also fall a height of h over here right because it's falling over here and it's rising over here h so if i consider these two points right if i consider this two points what is the total change in height it's going to be 2h and the pressure over here, so let's say a P pressure has been exerted after heating. And a total change of height to H occurs. So pressure is equal to H rho G. But H is 2H over here, so 2H rho G. So we can see the option D is 2H rho G. So that's going to be our answer. Okay. Uh, four metals, uh, four materials are formed into rods in the same dimension. At room temperature, which can sustain the largest plastic deformation? Okay. So, again, ductile metal, brittle metal, amorphous solids, uh, crystalline solids, these are not no longer in the syllabus. They are moved to the A2 syllabus. So, I'm not going to do this question. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, looks like all my fractions are gone. Uh, let's go ahead and bring it here okay these are all fractions I'm very sorry uh, I'll make sure that this doesn't happen next time okay two steel wires uh, P and Q have lengths L and 2L respectively and the cross-sectional area is uh, A and A by 2 respectively both wires obey Hooke's law what is the ratio of the tension in P when both rods are stretched to the same extension so let's say that both of the rods are stretched to the uh, extension uh, E now, both wires are made, okay, uh, have respectively stretched to the same extension. Two, okay, two steel wires, so both are steel. So let's say steel has a Young modulus of E. 
So we know the formulas is sigma is equal to E epsilon, where E is modulus of uh, elasticity. Sorry, E is the modulus, uh, young modulus. So not the modulus of elasticity, sorry. That's uh, further mechanics. So F by A is going to be E by epsilon. So epsilon is, so sigma is stress, stress is force by area. Epsilon is strain, strain is extension by length. So I'm going to first do it for wire P. So I'm going to do for FP. So what is FP? FP is E, E by L, right? Okay, now I'm going to do for FQ. So FQ is E, E by 2L. Oh, sorry, sorry. I forgot about cross-sectional area. I'm very sorry. There's an A. But over here, it has A by 2, right? This is the ratio. So now let's go ahead and do the ratio. The ratio is going to be between P and Q. So what is P? P is E, E by A, L divided by E, E, A by 2 by 2, L. Okay, I'm going to go here. So E, E, A. Okay, E, E, A by L. We're going to do the reciprocal, obviously. So 2, L by E, E, A by 2. So you can cancel this out, we can cancel this out, and remaining with 2a divided by half a, right? So we can cancel this out. So this should be basically uh, 4, okay? The result is going to be 4. So logically, my answer should be d, okay? Question number 21. Uh, a rubber band is stretched by hanging weights uh, on it and, and the force extension graph is plotted uh, from the results, okay? So, I can see the graph on my screen, hopefully you can also. If you cannot, please kindly use the question paper, uh, but the graph is visible. Uh, what is the best estimate? Okay, so, best estimate of the strain energy stored in the rubber band when it is extended to 30 centimeters. So, obviously, it should be area under the graph. Now, this is a curve, okay? We don't know the equation of the curve, so we cannot integrate. So we'll assume that, okay, this part will act as a trapezium. If this were a trapezium, we are going to get the force slightly higher. See, your confidence in x-ray is slightly higher. Then let's assume this to be rectangle. We're going to get slightly higher forces. And let's assume this to be triangle. Okay. Rectangle, triangle. So basically, strain energy. So this is a force extension graph, right? So the area under force extension, so work done is basically force times distance. So extension is a distance, so this is going to be the area. So first is half into 10, so it's done in centimeters. So just to be safe, we're going to convert it to meters into 5. Plus, uh, we have also have 10 divided by 100 into 5. Plus, uh, half into uh, 20, is 30. again it is 10, which is by 100 times um, so at this point, it was around here, right? If I'm not wrong, yes. So this is uh, 5, so 15, 16, uh, 17. My line is very crooked, so let me just, it's better I erase it. So, yeah, 16, 7, 16, 17. This is 17. Okay, so this is... Uh, 17 and what about this because this is trapezium i'm just going to erase all this and this is somewhere yes over here so this is six so this is 17 plus six okay so very big calculation you can use uh, your uh, calculator over here so 100 divided by five plus half into 10 by uh, 100 times 17 plus 6. So this comes to approximately around 1.9 joules, which is approximately 2 joules. So the answer is going to be A for this question, this specific uh, question. Okay, so next question. Diffraction is the name given to the addition of coherent waves. Okay, no, this is not obviously the definition of diffraction. Um, bending of waves around an obstacle. Yes. Change of direction. Okay, so no, it doesn't change. Splitting of whiteness into colors. No. 
So the option for the uh, answer for 22 should be B. Let's see, wave properties change when light passes from air into glass. Uh, which wave property changes when light passes from air into glass? So you notice that uh, when the wave comes in life, it bends and then it again kind of goes out like this. So there is this uh, refraction that's occurring due to incident light and the uh, uh, angle of incidence, the critical angle, angle of refraction, refractive index and all that. So color will never change. Frequency will never change. It can be the speed. Color will again never change. It can be the wavelength. So since it's bending, the speed is changing because uh, V is equal to F lambda, where F will remain always constant for a specific light or electromagnetic wave. So the only thing that can change are, sorry, not uh, V. The only thing that can change along with V is the lambda, which is the uh, wavelength. So it's going to be uh, C. Okay, uh, the diagram represents the pattern of stationary waves formed by the superposition of sound waves from loudspeaker and the reflection from a metal sheet, not shown. Okay, so a metal sheet that's not shown. So obviously if there's a metal sheet over here, it's going to form an anti-node. Sorry, a node over here. Over here. WX124 points on the line through, uh, through the center of these waves. Okay, W, X, Y, and Z. W is a node, Z is a node. Y and X are antinodes. An antinode is formed at the surface of the metal sheet. No, a node is formed. This is wrong. A node is a quarter of a wavelength from an adjacent antinode. So let's see a node and then we have an antinode over here. Right? Oh no, sorry. We have an antinode here as well. So let's use this example. So yes, this is a wave like this. So this is one fourth of lambda. A total wave would have been like uh, this. So this is one fourth of lambda. True. The oscillations of X are in phase with those of Y. So X and Y. Uh, so this is between uh, th uh, three adjacent nodes. So between two adjacent nodes, they're in phase, but between uh, three adjacent nodes, they will be out of phase, one into the out of phase. So they're not in phase. The decision wave oscillate at right angles to the line WZ. The stationary wave oscillate at right angles. No, it doesn't oscillate at uh, right angles. Stationary waves are, you know, just like formed on the wave, sometimes long, sometimes flat. So it's like the combination, the superposition of two waves. So no, if they don't oscillate at right angles. So that answer should be B for this uh, MCQ. Okay, so again, these are fractions. Okay. A diffraction grating with n lines per meter is used to uh, deflect light of various wavelengths lambda. The diagram shows the relation between the deflection angle theta for different wavelength values lambda in the nth order of interference pattern. Okay. So the gradient of this line, uh, okay, what is the gradient of the graph? So the gradient of this line is change in y by change in it. So this is basically sine theta, change in sine theta by change in lambda. So we know the formula that relates uh, lines per meter and uh, line spacing with the amount of orders of a diffraction rating is n lambda d sine theta, All right? So what is the gradient of the graph basically? So if we uh, put out the ratio of sine theta by lambda, it is going to be n by d, right? So, n lines per meter. Okay. So, n line, what is n lines uh, per meter? Basically, the value of d is 1 by n. Right? The value of d is 1 by n, if it's n lines per meter. So, it's basically n by 1 by uh, n. Oh, uh, sorry. So this is basically n by 1 by n. If you're confused that n lines per meter, that means there are n number of lines in 1 meter. But how many, in how many meter is there one line? Because it's lines per minute, this is the uh, gaps between the lines. So within 1 meter, uh, how many lines are there within uh, that 1 meter radius? So how much distance, like how much space will just a single line cover? It's 1 by n. That's why 
the value of b is 1 by n okay if you're confused about that so this should be basically n multiplied by being n so for 25 the answer should be a okay uh, a stationary wave of frequency 80 hertz is set up uh, on a straight string of length uh, this much okay so we can see that this is covering so i'm going to use a uh, a highlighter to see so we are covering one wave over here. This is one lambda. Now I'm going to change my highlighter color. And we are co covering uh, half of wavelength. So we can say one lambda. Oops, sorry. It's uh, like that. So we can say one lambda plus half lambda is equal to 210 centimeter. So what is one plus half? So one plus 0.5 is basically three by two lambda. So 3 by 2 lambda is covering 210 centimeters. So what is 1 lambda covering? So it's basically 210 times 2 by 3. It should be covering 140 centimeters. So we have obtained the wavelength. So obviously now I can find the speed. V is equal to F lambda. So V is 80. Lambda is 140. So we have to convert to meters. We divide by 100. So 140 divided by 100 into 80. That gives us 112 meter per second. So the answer uh, for 26 is going to be B. Okay. Uh, the diagram shows uh, the paths of two charged particles X and Y during uh, their uh, passage between a pair of oppositely charged metal plates P and Q. The plates are charged such that an electric field between them is directed from uh, Q to P. Okay. So the plates are charged in such a way that these are directed from P to, P to Q. So this has to be positive, then Q has to have the negative charge. So X has to be positively charged, Y has to be uh, negatively charged. So what is X? Uh, the place uh, pass between. Oh, so both of them, you can see both of them are going in the same direction. So the diagram is a little bit unclear. If you're unable to see the screen, you can use a question paper. Both of them are going downwards. So if this is... Uh, Sorry, it's directed. Uh, I messed up the whole thing. Sorry. Uh, this was confused. It's directed from Q to P. So Q has to be positive, P has to be negative. So these, if this is positive, these have, both have to be negative charges to go towards Q. So it has to be negative, 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 negative. So the answer is going to be A for this one. Uh, okay. There is a potential difference between a pair of parallel plates. What is the value of the potential difference and separation of the plates that will produce an electric uh, field strength of greatest value? So, uh, electric field strength is basically force by charge, which is also equal to uh, potential difference by the distance of the two plates. So, if we want this to be the greatest, then this has to be less. So, it has to be, sorry, these are all d by 2, okay? d by 2, v by 2. So, 28, right? Yes. And uh, what potential difference? The potential difference, if it's high, E also is a potential difference has to be the highest. So it's actually 2V. So it has to be the answer, B. Okay, so work done by electric fiends that's a A2, A2 chapter now. They're in much more detail. They have uh, work done by electric fields, then electric field constant. You have the epsilon over there. Uh, different. So it's a lot more depth in A2, but this is removed from our AS syllabus. In fact, I actually forgot and mistakenly did 27 and 28 as well. If you're giving an AS exam this year on 2023, you don't need to worry. These two are not in your syllabus. Okay? Even these two are not in your syllabus. Okay. So let's go ahead and move on. A 12 volt battery is charged for 20 minutes by connecting it to a source of electromotive force EMF. The battery is supplied with this many joules of energy in this time. How much charge flows into it? So energy is equal to VIT. So VIT is basically what? Q. So it's EQ. Okay. How much charge flows into the battery? Okay, so we know the time and everything, so we need to use the bigger formula. E is equal to VIT. Okay, cool. So 
we know that e is 7.2 to 10 to the power 4 is equal to v, which is 12, times the value of i that we want to find out, times t, 20 times 60. So i comes out to be 7.2 times 10 to the power 4 times 60. i comes out to be 5 amperes. So q has to be i t, so 5 into 20 into 60. So 5 into 20 into 60, which goes to 6,000 joules. Sorry, not joules. Uh, it has to be coulombs. Sorry, sorry. Uh, coulombs, so it's going to be D. Uh, what is meant by electromotive force of a cell? Okay, the definition of an electromotive force is the energy required to move, uh, the energy required to convert uh, non-electrical energy, so non-electrical energy to electrical energy, uh, when driving one coulomb or one unit of charge around a complete circuit. So energy converted into electrical energy, yes. Transferred by the cell. Okay, in a circuit it can be transferred by the cell. Uh, through the external resistance, no. Not the external, the internal resistance, no. Through the component itself, infinity to the positive pole, no. This is actually uh, totally different. This is regarding magnetic fields. So this is totally wrong. So the only option is going to be A. Okay, two cells of EMF, uh, 3 volt and 12 volt are negligible internal resistance, I connect to resistors of 9 ohms and 18 ohms. What is the current? I is the 9 ohm resistor. Okay. Two cells. So what is the potential difference across the two cells? Which is 3 minus 1.2, right? The potential difference across the two cells. So 3 minus 1.2. So potential difference of 1.8 will be observed you know, between the two cells, okay, two cells. So we're going to be using Kirchhoff's law and we're going to be only considering one loop, okay? We're going to consider this loop because we are one per current from this loop. So this loop is the loop we're going to consider using Kirchhoff's law. So using Kirchhoff's voltage law, okay, using Kirchhoff's voltage law. Uh, now, if I didn't subtract it over here, it wouldn't be correct because I'm going to consider this positive, my starting point. That means everything else is going to be negative. So it's going to be positive 3.0 minus 9i, right? Minus 1.2. Now we already know the value which is 1.8, which is equal to 0. So 1.8 minus 9i is equal to 0. Now remember, Kirchhoff's law says that in a closed loop, the sum of EMF and sum of PD is equal to k, 0. So that's why you're using equal to 0, okay, if you're unclear about that. So my current comes out to be 0.2 amperes. So we have got 0 0.2. So 33 is B, 0 0.2 amperes. Okay, so we seem to have something about resistors. Interesting, very easy question. Uh, six identical resistors of 12 ohm resistor arranged in two groups with three in series and the other three in parallel. So resistance total in series, we just add them. So it's 12 plus 12 plus 12. So basically it's 12 into three, which is 36 ohms. So I can cancel out A and B. Okay. Now these in parallel, R total is actually 1 by 12, 1 by 12, 1 by 12 to the power uh, negative 1. I don't know while editing if this will come in the video, so let me pull it here. Okay. And then you're just going to do 1 by 12 plus 1 by 12 plus... Oh, oops, sorry. I'm calculating it wrong which is equal to 4 ohms. This is 36 ohms, this is 4 ohms. So basically we only have one 4 ohms, so if we had found out the series one first, maybe we would have got an answer much more quicker. Anyways, okay, uh, looks like we have thermistors and light dependent resistors. Okay, the diagram shows uh, a light dependent resistor R, uh, so resistor in circuit P and a thermistor in circuit Q. How does the potential difference across the fixed resistor in each circuit change when both the brightness of the light on the light dependent resistor and temperature thermistor increased? So remember, when we increase, uh, sorry, in a light dependent resistor, okay? Remember, increase is always positive, right? So when we increase light in light dependent resistor, the resistance decreases. So both the thermistor increased, resistance decreases. When the temperature is increased in the thermistor, the resistance decreases. So the voltage across that resistor will decrease. So in both cases for the uh, fixed resistor, the voltage or the potential difference across it will increase. So the answer for 35 will be 10. Okay, easy. 
36. How do uh, how do the nucleon mass number and proton atomic number of two isotopes of an element uh, compare? So nucleon number for isotopes, nucleon number will always be different, but proton number will always be same. So it's going to uh, wait the nuclear mass number and proton number. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Nuclear number is the mass number. Sorry, the nucleus number. Okay, the number of nucleus, not nucleus number. Uh, I'm writing nucleoli. Sorry. Nucleus number changes. Number of nucleus change. Okay, so yeah, so if the number of nucleus changes, then proton number has to remain the same. So this has to be different. Sorry. So the answer will be brief. Oh, got confused. Okay. Uh, this one, this question. Uh, nuclear decay is both spontaneous and random. When is the uh, when the counter of a radiator isotope is measured, the readings fluctuate. Which row describes the fluctuations? Uh, de uh, fluctuations demonstrate. Okay, so spontaneous nature, spontaneous nature. Okay, so which de uh, demonstrates fluctuations? The spontaneous nature means not affected by external factors. So not affected by external factors. And this doesn't cause the effect on fluctuation. So I will say that this is no. Whereas for random nature, yes. So random nature, that means the count rate of the radioactive decay is different. So for random nature, this is going to be yes. So for me, 70, 37 is going to be uh, B. Which two nuclei uh, contain the same number of neutrons? Okay. So same number of neutrons. So uh, over here, 12, uh, minus, this is 6, and four, uh, six uh, 14 minus 6. So if we do 14 minus 6, this is... Uh, 8, so this is incorrect. Uh, if we do 16 minus, sorry, 16 minus 7, we get 9. If we do 15 minus 8, we get uh, 7. So this is incorrect. So 23 minus 11, we get 12. 24 minus 12, we also get 12. So this is going to be sync. So if you're wondering how I got the nuclear number, it's basically, uh, if you don't take chemistry, this is C, 12, and 6. So we just minus 12 and 6. We minus the uh, molar mass of the atom divided by the atomic number of the atom. Okay, last two questions. Uh, the calcium nuclide, uh, 4220 Ca, is formed by beta decay. What is the nuclear number mass of the proton of the atomic number of the unstable nuclear that underwent beta decay to form calcium? So if we reverse the process, okay, when you're having beta decay, and these are old years, so you'll assume that all beta decay is a beta minus. For recent years, you have to consider between beta plus and beta minus, and they'll usually tell you. So if we reverse the process of the beta minus decay, the nuclear number changes, sorry, the atomic number should decrease by one. Uh, oh, sorry, why did I write 60? It's 20, so this will become 19. So proton number will be 19, but the nucleon number will remain the same, so the answer will be C. For the last question, uh, boron 11 is bombarded with alpha particles. A new nucleus is formed and a new neutron, and a neutron is released. What is the nuclear equation that could represent this? So it's uh, so this is incorrect for a helium. Uh, helium is 4-2. And alpha is also 4 2. So alpha is basically a helium particle. So it's either between C and D. Okay. And uh, when you heat it with alpha particles, a new nucleus is formed and a neutron is released. Okay. And a neutron is released. So neutron will have a mass of, uh, sorry, a charge of 0. So it cannot have a charge of 1. So this is going to be incorrect because this 1 represents the positive amount of charges, the protonic charges. So it's 1. So that's incorrect. So our forward is going to be D. And that's the end of this paper.